Chang and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology, where we bring you all our top interviews from this week in tech. Coming up, Uber has a new number two. Why CEO Dara Khosrowshahi tapped the former head of Orbitz to join his team. Plus, Coinbase's insider trading suspicion, the investigation into a sudden spike in Bitcoin cash just before it was officially introduced on one of America's most popular cryptocurrency exchanges. And our exclusive interview with Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan, why he's skeptical about Bitcoin. But first to our lead and a Bloomberg scoop. Uber has a new number two. The world's most valuable startup has named Barney Harford its chief operating officer. Harford is the former CEO of the online travel site Orbitz and is the second high profile hire by new Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi. Harford has worked both for and competed with Khosrow Shahi in the online travel sector. And it is an interesting move considering the other Uber news out Wednesday, the European Union's top court has officially ruled that the ride hailing service should be regulated as a transport company rather than a digital one. The ruling is aimed at Uber Pop, an inexpensive service in European cities that allows drivers without a taxi license to use their own cars to pick up passengers, the equivalent of UberX. We spoke with Frederick Court, Felix Capital Managing Partner from London, along with Bloomberg Technologies, Eric Newcomer. Well, he has a long history with Dara Khosrow Shahi, so I think that's definitely helpful. This is sort of a loyalist that you can bring in, sort of a trusted hand. So I think that's part of it. Barney did a really good job at Orbitz. It was a debt-laden company. Uh, he was able to sort of get a good exit of $1.6 billion, selling it to Dara's Expedia. Mm. So, and then, you know, the experience at Orbitz and an Expedia marketplace businesses, which is super relevant to Uber. So it's relevant expertise. It's having a good relationship already with the CEO. And then he was doing this advisor role since October to sort of feel the company out a little bit. Harvard wrote a series of tweets after your story saying Uber already does more rides than the world's airlines combined flies passengers and provides flexible work opportunities to more people than any other company in the world. You know, what does the hire of, uh, you know, a former airline industry expert imply about the direction that Dara wants to take this company? Yeah, he's still on the United board and really understands that business. I mean, I, I think it shows the global reach and seriousness of the Uber's business as an employer, for one. I think, you know, his tweets speak to the amount that he thinks about Uber as this global employer that really has to take an obligation to how it treats its drivers. So I think that's going to be a top priority for him. And then, you know, the airline industry is sort of a parallel that Uber does not love because airlines have these huge expensive planes. But, uh, you know, Barney also made the point to me that airlines are doing much better these days are more profitable businesses but certainly that expertise as a business model comparison but then also sort of as a similar service industry is useful background to bring to Uber. Now I want to talk about this in the context of this news out of the EU that Uber will now be regulated as a transport company and not essentially a tech company which is what they were hoping for. This is a big blow yeah. to Uber. What does this actually mean? Well, yeah, it's bad for Uber because it just it means more regulation, means more sort of uh, the potential that they could uh, have to pay their drivers more, have more regulated rules around how they pay their drivers instead of being this sort of digital platform that's sort of super disconnected from the rules of local regulators. On the other hand, Uber's already regulated as a transportation company in London and Paris, two of its most profitable markets. So it's already started to deal with this, and Dara's stance has generally been, we're going to work with local regulators to sort of allow them to regulate us as they want. Obviously, we're going to have input. And so I think, you know, this, this is bad, and Uber's lobbied against it, but the company's already started, started to pivot to to deal with what they saw coming. Frederick, as a longtime investor in Europe, you know, what do you make of this decision given the challenges that Uber is facing in London specifically where you are? 
No, it's, um, it's, a, uh, it's, it's interesting and it's basically a confirmation that I think local regulators uh, well, in Europe, but I think it's the case also across the, the globe, uh, are looking at these um, you know, tech, uh, tech companies and say actually we have rules uh, and you, you've got to operate within the context of those rules. So in the short term, it doesn't change too much for Uber because Uber had to operate within those parameters, but it does cap the potential upside. Now, the peer-to-peer -peer service that they were hoping to launch across multiple countries, and in certain countries, they were, uh, Uber was planning to enter just with peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, that will not be possible. So that restricts the opportunity, and it's, a, it's an interesting time because as a user, and I ke keep on hearing this anecdotally, uh, the experience, the Uber experience for consumers has, <clears throat> over the past you know, four to six months, been diluted. Know, harder to get cars, um, you know, drivers cancelling. They, it's almost as if the change of guard and change of management and maybe the release of the pressure has, has had an impact at the level of the customer experience. Um, so I think uh, you know, bringing new management that will sort of tighten the grip on the business again is highly needed. And in the, in the short term, um, Uber has got to focus on its core. So what signal do you think this sends from European regulators about the gig economy in general? I mean, there's this talk that it could also be affecting a company like Airbnb, you know, in, in that it may be, you know, in the future regulated more like a hotel than a home rental site, as they would prefer. Yeah, I think there is a sort of general move and realization um, across Europe that the many of the tech uh, companies that are global, that have launched very successfully uh, services that have become dominant across Europe, uh, have done that by you know, pushing maybe the boundaries, uh, boundaries too much, and also importantly, not sort of paying their fair share of taxes. So I think it's, it's fair to expect a, um, yes, a tightening of the grip, and also realization by the local authorities that they do need to create a sort of a leveling playing field for the local operators as well um, and uh, force uh, you know, certain rules but also certain fiscal uh, sort of discipline on top of those companies who've been able to use Ireland as a place to you know, do some invoicing and we see that changing with Facebook as well. Uh, so we, we expect, uh, at least on, on our side, we, we, we see a kind of wave of change and there is demand from consumers, from politicians, um, uh, from the local uh, services and businesses uh, to say, hey, uh, maybe we've been too open. When you look at China, China has been very good at sort of closing those, uh, those doors uh, and, and maybe it's time for Europe to do a little bit of that as well. So Eric, you know, we know Dara Khosrow Shah, he has been traveling a lot, he's been to London now. How do you think this ruling will impact his strategy? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of Europe that still needs to get figured out. And I mean, I think with hiring Barney, it's sort of a statement. OK, internally, somebody else who's you know, as skilled as me needs to run the internal business because there's so much to do outside. I mean, you know, the situation in Southeast Asia, competing with Grab and Gojek is a live mm -hmm. question, whether Uber will come to some sort of truce, merger, acquisition, what's going to happen there. Similarly, in India, so all over the world, there are these questions either strategic dealing with competitors or you know countries where the regulations still aren't figured out and so I think he's very much going to be that public face you know traveling around and either establishing themselves better in markets cutting deals or making an apology as necessary that was Frederick Court Felix Capital managing partner and Bloomberg Technologies Eric Newcomer well, this week, tech watchers finally got a glimpse of one of the most long-awaited products. Secretive startup Magic Leap unveiled stills of its mixed reality headset. According to the pictures, the steampunk-esque goggles come with a controller and computing pack to wear around your waist. Magic Leap has long kept a tight lid on this headset, but it's now facing increased competition from the likes of Google and Apple in augmented reality. Bloomberg has previously reported the gear will cost between $1,500 and $2,000. And speaking of gadgets, coming up, we will take a look at the big year in consumer tech from Amazon to Google and Apple. What worked, what didn't, and what's worth your money? And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
Facebook has introduced new features to curb abuse and protect privacy on the platform. New facial recognition features should help prevent unwanted contact like friend requests and messages when someone you have blocked sets up a new account or tries to contact you from another account that they control. The new features also provide the option to ignore a messenger conversation and automatically move it out of your inbox without having to block the sender. Meantime, WhatsApp was given a month to comply with French privacy law and stop transferring data from Facebook users without their consent, the country's regulator warned. CNIL, France's data protection authority, said it wants to ensure the highest level of transparency on the massive data transfer from WhatsApp to Facebook, according to a statement posted on its website Monday. This comes after 28 EU privacy watchdogs published a letter sent in October to WhatsApp's co-founder to reassert their concerns over changes to the messaging services privacy policy. Well, tech's big three are constantly fighting for retail supremacy. So just how did Apple, Amazon, and Google try to win your hearts and wallets in 2017? Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman takes a look. It's been a jam-packed year for new tech products, and all of the big players are now vying for every part of your life. Google is no longer just a search company. Amazon is more than a retail channel, and Apple more than ever is going for the high end. They're all trying to fight to be your number one, and they're releasing more and more products to safeguard each of their ecosystems. Apple is going for the high end of the most central part of your life, the smartphone with the iPhone 10. Without a doubt, this was the most anticipated gadget of the year and perhaps the biggest iPhone update in the company's history. So far, it's been a hit with consumers and it's leading Apple to expect a record-breaking $80 billion holiday quarter. Apple's looking to round out its hold on you with the 4K version of the Apple TV, an LTE Apple Watch, and the AirPods, which all make a nice combo. Google wants to sell you a $400, super loud, high-end speaker that works well with its new Pixel 2 phone. I wouldn't recommend Google's new Pixel Buds headphones, but their speaker with stereo sound could be a better fit for your home than the upcoming HomePod. Amazon is trying to be everywhere in your room and has released several new Echo speakers this year. My favorite, the Echo Spot. It's the alarm clock and nightstand device of the future. It integrates with their music and video streaming services and is a solid holiday gift for the gadget lover in your home. The top companies are already looking toward next year's holiday season as well. Apple's HomePod, its Google Home and Echo Challenger, will come out in early 2018 after being delayed from this month. And the iPhone maker is already working on its next iPhones as well as an iPad with Face ID facial recognition for next year, Bloomberg has reported. Google, for its part, is working on a new home speaker with a screen, and Amazon, of course, is always working on new Echoes. Happy holidays. Coming up, Bitcoin hits another gear on a bigger stage. Why this week's CME debut could play a defining role in the cryptocurrency's continuing march to the mainstream. Plus, one of the most popular cryptocurrencies on the planet is facing its biggest controversy to date. Why Coinbase is investigating possible insider trading on its platform. Next, this is Bloomberg. biggest exchange just joined the Bitcoin revolution. Bitcoin futures started trading this past Sunday night on the CME just a week after Chicago rival SIBO introduced similar derivatives on the volatile cryptocurrency. CME is a much bigger player in futures with many traders expecting it to make a bigger splash in the space. The exchange got off to a faster start with more efficient pricing. Its most active contract changed hands 221 times in the first hour versus 570 during SIBO's debut. It's a huge win because CME's contracts are five times more valuable. They're tied to five Bitcoin compared to only one with SIBO's futures. We caught up with our Bloomberg editor-at-large, Corey Johnson, along with Polychain Capital CEO Olaf carlson Wee. Polychain is a hedge fund that invests in digital currencies, including Ethereum, and is backed by Andreessen Horowitz and Union Square Ventures. So it's very, very important that these kinds of more advanced financial products and hedging mechanisms are introduced for these institutional investors. For a lot of these institutional investors, it's really the first time they've been able to go long or short on Bitcoin. So uh, we have a chart here, G hashtag BTV7264, showing how uh, futures got off at the CME, at the SIBO today as well. Corey, you know, what's your take on the significance of this week versus last week? Well, I, I think, you know, 
this is a this is a product and exchange where a lot of big money trades and a lot of uh, uh, bigger funds and, and and groups are unable to trade this for legal reasons or to trade the actual currency itself. So this is the only product that they can legally get involved in, whether it's based on their charter or, or depending on where they're trading. So they can actually a lot more money can be attracted to these cyber currencies without actually having to be involved with the cyber currencies themselves. So Olaf, how does the last two weeks change what you're doing day to day at your hedge fund? Well, so the main thing is that there's been. Makes a, you wish you were more long. Right? Yeah. Well, we're long only. So, uh, but there, there's just a, been a huge amount of media uh, interest in this area. There's been a, a, a huge number of consumer retails, co retailers coming online, uh, just purchasing Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. I think that we're seeing more and more uh, institutional and Wall Street um, players coming onto the scene and wanting to go long in this area. So I, I just think it's great for the whole industry and it's really pushing things forward. Right, Corey. You also have TD Ameritrade on Friday. Saying they're now getting into this, you know. Right, but you know, with, with significant requirements for margin, given the volatility, requiring that people have just got so much money behind this in order to trade, it's not as simple as just trading a stock or even a currency. A, a lot of that owing to volatility, but I think also owing to kind of the, the mania around this. So, Olaf, you know, you and I were talking before the show. The price has just soared. I feel like every time you, <laughs> every time you yeah. come on, I say, "Are we in a bubble?" You know. And the price keeps going higher and higher and higher. I mean, does the, the, the rapid rise of the price make you question the legitimacy of the value here? Well, so, so what we're seeing in a way is it's, it's not that dissimilar from the rapid rise you might see from other technologies. So when you look at um, a, a breakout startup like, say, Uber, um, we're seeing a similar rapid rise there, but it's all happening in private markets that are relatively illiquid. Here you're seeing retail investors um, with the ability to actually gain exposure to this breakthrough technology and see that rise very viscerally uh, day to day. So I, I think it's, it's not that dissimilar from the types of growth you might see from other kind of breakout industries or technologies. I, I do think that this is much bigger, though, than any individual company. So it's not surprising to me at all that we're seeing this type of growth. Um, um, I, I think that it feels somewhat inevitable to many of us that have been in this ecosystem for many years. Corey, do you agree with that comparison? Well, I, I mean, it's not just the coins, right? It's not just a couple. It's not Ethereum and Bitcoin Ripple. There, there is a lot of junk out there. There are a lot of stocks that are flying. A lot. There's, I was looking today at a company that was a Chinese energy company. Now it's. A, a, a blockchain Internet of Things exploration company with 18 employees, and it's got a three and a half billion dollar valuation. Stocks up 860 percent in the last week. That's a mania, and that's mania not based on actually what's going on or what, even what the potential is for this technology. It's just a mania of people well, running. Well, you know what I think is pushing calls. a lot of behavior like that is the inability of these institutional investors to get exposure, because a lot of these institutional investors don't have the ability to buy the underlying assets. I think when they do have the ability to buy a Maybe. stock I mean, in this area, it, it inflates. But, the value. When, but whenever you see a mania, whether it's the dot com boom or whether heck, when it was uranium in the 1960s, you would see well there were legitimate investments in real companies, there was a lot of junk and there were a lot of hucksters and there were a lot of people trying to take the money of people who were interested in an idea and run with it somewhere else. We saw that in real estate, you know, not too many years ago, 10 years ago in real estate, there were people selling fake properties or people who were borrowing money to own many homes. There was all kinds of financial fraud, both at giant companies like Countrywide and on an individual basis. And I think that we're seeing that in this general notion of cyber currencies. And once in a while, we can grab into some real things like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, and we can look at some fake things like some of the these stocks that are running with no fundamentals whatsoever and recognize those are happening in concert. So Olaf, are you seeing anything that makes you uneasy and if so, what? So I, I just think that this area is so emergent and so experimental. Um, I actually think it's really good that money is flowing into things that are, are, are less sure. Um, now that said, you know, I think my not for the people who lose money. But yeah, okay. no, of course, of course. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, I, I think my number one concern is um, people basically investing in things that they don't understand. This is very complicated and esoteric technology, and I think that um, your kind of retail mom and pop investors should be careful, um, particularly when they're investing in more experimental technologies outside of what I might call the, the blue chip cryptocurrencies here, uh, like Bitcoin and Ethereum. How long do you think it will be before we see other crypto futures being offered? Oh, I think over this year we'll be we'll see dozens of other crypto futures. And I think we're going to see some stocks blow up too, and some some real frauds emerge. I mean. 
You know, one of these companies today is this long, thin corporation traded 15 million shares at a $20 valuation uh, two days ago. It's a stock, again, is flying through the roof with basically no financials. A company that brought the IPO and has got 13 centers against it uh, from securities regulators has paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. And I don't think the people who are buying this thing have any idea who they're buying it from or what that, or that firm's history is. They just want to get near something that's blockchain-y and see it go up. If there is some sort of crash or correction or let's all come back to earth event, Olaf, how far out is something like that? Well, so if you kind of zoom out, um, cryptocurrency has been filled with these pretty massive corrections throughout its history. I think this is just a natural part of where, where there's a disparity between the number of people that see what feels like a somewhat inevitable future and then what the, where the technology is today. And, and to bring it back to the news of today, the trading of these future contracts makes it less likely that we'll see downside or any volatility like we've seen in the past because what it means is on the downside, you're going to have short sellers looking to cover those short positions and buying positions as prices come off. So you won't see those 20% corrections like we've seen in Bitcoin many, many times in the last couple of years. We also dug into Coinbase this week as the company investigates allegations of insider trading on its platform. The alleged trading came in the hours before the company announced it would enable Bitcoin Cash. Meanwhile, the volatile crypto market is gaining the attention of global institutions. Here's what Bank of England Governor Mark Carney had to say about Bitcoin this week in London. It's increased significantly in value, uh, but it's not connected to the core of the financial system in general. It's not, it's not levered. Um, and um, orders of magnitude, it's less than the market cap, half the market cap of Apple. So it's significant, but or if you add Bitcoin and some of the other major cryptocurrencies, uh, it's in that order of magnitude. Uh, significant, but it's more like an equity type risk that's spread fairly widely around, uh, around the world. Corey Johnson joined us once again to wrap up all this news in cryptocurrency. So this is the great fear of an unregulated market, which is that someone will take advantage of that to do something illegal or maybe not illegal, just really uh, deceptive and take money from investors by taking the role uh, as, as a market maker. It's a great fear for Coinbase, certainly, uh, and a great fear for anyone involved in this trading that, that the, the regulated trading that we're used to, that have investor protections built into it, and it had uh, a centuries of investor protections that have built up over time, are not extant in the world of trading in these uh, cryptocurrencies, and that someone could have jumped in there ahead of trades and engaged in insider trading. Right, and so the fear is that Coinbase employees are front running or someone, right? We know that Coinbase was, was being attacked by hackers. Uh, there were denial of service attacks across the industry. We don't know who could have gotten into their systems. We don't know who, uh, how their systems work. We know that they're not regulated and they're not uh, monitored. I, I, I don't like to use the word regulation because it, it, it has uh, mm -hmm. really bad connotations. I think anytime anyone uses the word regulation in any context, we can at least think that uh, regulations ex exist at least initially as protections. And the pro investor protections and the, and the market monitoring that happens across most trading a world, certainly the United States, doesn't happen with Bitcoin. So Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, said they won't hesitate to fire anyone. Right. There's been a lot of chatter about this. Uh, Connor Sen, a portfolio manager for New River Investments, who's also a Bloomberg View columnist, tweeted, my own personal view is Coinbase is a zero over the next three years due to sketchy stuff that will take them down in a bust. That's strong. Uh, it is strong, but you know this, this is the issue, right? I mean, this is when you make a market a fair and orderly market is the principal guiding rule to creating a fair and orderly market and letting investors know they're going to get a fair and orderly market. No one's going to go to trade if they know that they can't go anywhere else number one, mm -hmm. and then they're going to get a bad price. The price they're getting is not going to be fair. That could destroy the business of Coinbase. And, and, and this is a this kind of reputational issue is extraordinarily serious. Our Bloomberg editor at large there, Corey Johnson. Still ahead, our exclusive interview with Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan. Why he's skeptical about Bitcoin. And a reminder, all episodes of Bloomberg Tech are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology, weekdays 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Investment firms, large and small, are grappling with how technology 
can be used to disrupt the financial industry, and that includes Bank of America. Under CEO Brian Moynihan, the company has made strides using features like AI and voice recognition to improve the banking experience for its customers. Moynihan sat down with Bloomberg Television in an exclusive interview and discussed the transformation. Since I've been CEO, I had somebody look this up the other day because I was doing something else. We're about $25 billion in coding in the eight years. Wow. Ago. And so you start to think about that. That's a lot of feature functionality, improvements, and everything going on. But it's the nature of what, so it's about two and a half to three billion dollars a year, and it, you know, a little higher when we're doing mergers and stuff. And the idea is that we're a technology company. We're basically a very group, a talented group of 200 and some thousand teammates in a bunch of huge computer technology systems and then analytical frameworks that work on it too. And that's what we do. You know, it's ones and zeros in money. The you know, money's digital. Mm -hmm. The activities are digital. The, the, the huge system. So, knitting that together at the customer and for our teammates is huge. So, what will happen between the uh, improvements in voice recognition and, and artificial intelligence and data storage and retrieval and Wi-Fi network and networks being able to transmit on a Wi-Fi basis? You know, tons of data without having a battery go down in 10 seconds. You know, all that swimming together is important because having all the data in the world unless the person who's going to act on it has it, which requires the storage, the retrieval, the analytics, and the distribution to a, uh, an iPad in one of our branches. It, the last part, you, you, you hit a moat. So the question is you got to have it all come together. The, the, the advances are tremendous, and so I see that. So when we think about Erica, which is a, a voice or text activated artificial intelligence agent, 800 For teammates. Bank are of America out, specifically, it, Erica. 800 teammates are working on it today as a test, and it'll come out to the public over the next couple of quarters. What we think that would be is a much better experience for customers to get the questions they want to be answered quickly. Um, but it's going to be, it takes high touch and high tech. We, we have a million people coming to our branches every day. We've got to do a great job there. We've got to do a great job with the 30, 24 million mobile customers we had today and the 35 million digital customers we had today. And we've got to do a great job with Alexa, it, or Erica, and that will build. And, and we'll interface with Alexa and, and all the different variations, Siri and everything. But it's really using all this. But the number one thing is you can't get ahead of the customer. Hmm. And the number two thing is you're going to be investing far before the activity changes material. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all the digital wallets that we have, Samsung Pay, Apple Pay, and, you know, Android Pay, they're still a very small percentage of debit card currency. It's growing. And someday, a decade from now, it'll be a big number. But you got to work, you got to have it in order to make it go there. Zelle, which is tremendously important to us. Again, it's growing 100% per year, year over year. It, it's, it's, it, but still, it's a minor amount of the payments that go on out of consumers' accounts, largely because they're still learning how to use it. So we've got to educate them and help them, and the industry has built this thing. Tremendously great product for customers. We just have to drive it out there. And so, so technology without that human adoption, both from the teammate or not, is important. And so yeah, we've invested a lot. We'll continue to invest. We think of ourselves as a technology-driven company. Um, it requires us to invest a lot in cyber and other things to protect those assets. Um, but when you put it all together, at the end of the day, we're high touch and high tech because you can't do one without the other. You're, you say about 210,000 employees at Bank of America right now. Five years, how many people work here and how many of them will be, we would call them tech people now? Is there a shift in the balance within that workforce? The, it's a little hard to say how many people, because we, we have 2,000 more sales team, relationship teammates from the third quarter 16 to third quarter 17, while the headcount went down about four or 5,000 people. So you have to realize yeah, we're yeah. investing. Yeah. And so as we downsize branches, we've upsized the number of people. And, if, uh, and so I, I, everybody is technology oriented, the company has to be. So if you go downstairs in the branch here, you'll see that they're working off iPads and they're doing what you can do yourself mm -hmm. because it's the fastest way to do it. So I, are they coding? No, but they're working on technology mm -hmm. and they're driving, or they're working on analytics or working on algorithm models, or they're serving customers using technology. So, you know, so the automation in the Meggy platform we have, which is uh, an automated rebalancing, you know, based on your risk perception, which is growing very quickly. It, it is a piece of technology, but still people need to be behind it to a, build it, and also to answer questions about it, because customers never are pure. They do want to know, did I do the right thing? Did I get this right? And so we have financial advisors in the branches, and then we have Merrill Financial Advisors, depending on the wealth of the customer, to deal with it. So you say money is sort of like ones and O's. Yeah. It brings us to Bitcoin. What about blockchain? Does Bitcoin have a future in Bank of America's existence, and what is it? The, the, 
it, it, when, I, when you separate this question, you have the blockchain technology, yes. which is distributed ledger and verified ledger, all the different words. That's tremendously important, and I think we have 37 patents already in for that, and you know, we're using it in various w ways, and the industry's using it ways, because we had to figure out ways we could uh, verify very complex transactions where a lot of information and money are moving together. When you talk about digital movement of money, one half of the money moved by consumers today at Bank of America, today, is moved digitally. One half. This is not something new. When you get to an anonymous currency, that's a different question. And that's a policy question of whether we want an anonymous currency out there of size and scale and scope. And that's what the you start to see people struggle. Is. Do and you think we do? Do you think we I, want I, it? I, I don't think you want it. I think the reason why the $100 bill is the largest denomination of bills was to make money more difficult to move other than through a verifiable system. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a lesson a lot of economies have learned over time as they brought their denominations down to improve the transparency of the economy, mm -hmm. the ability to track it, the ability to find the money, the ability to have it come through in that huge AML and KYC work we do and the industry does. And it helps you f find all kinds of interesting things and, and that's important for law enforcement and other types of things. So it, I think that that's not, good. the speculation I'll let other people reflect on it. <laughs> You're seeing great debates on it. But I, I think you know, the idea of digitizing money is not new. The wire system is a digital transfer mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. the ACH system. The question is, what's exciting is when you can walk around Bryant Park out here and go in these little shops that are set up for Christmas and be able to tap your phone or something like that as opposed to being carrying dollars. Those are exciting things. It, to get that last mile electronified, that's what, to have you and I exchange money if we had lunch together through Zell. That's that's exciting. That takes the cash because in the end of the day, of the fifty-three billion dollars expenses on round numbers we'll have next year, five of it will be to move coin, currency, and checks around the system. Hmm. And if I can take that down in a safe, verifiable ability to do it, know your customer in AML, take that down. That's a very valuable thing for us, and then you just ripple that through the industry. And we, we used to quote that we could ask them to destroy every we could We could pay them to reprint the money rather than have to cycle it back in and out because it was cheaper to move it around. That was Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan speaking to Bloomberg's David Weston. Well, Disney and 21st Century Fox lost their bid to keep sensitive business documents out of the antitrust case that pits AT&T against the U.S. Justice Department. Disney had sought to shield information relating to agreements that the company and Fox have with pay TV companies to distribute their programming, as well as data on revenue, pricing, and subscribers. The U.S. government seeks to interview as many as 50 witnesses ahead of trial. <laughs> Well, this week, Elon Musk gave his phone number to his 16.7 million Twitter followers. In what looked to be a message intended for John Carmack, the co-founder of Oculus, Musk wrote, quote, do you have a sec to talk? My cell is dot, 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 and then proceeded to write the digits. The Tesla CEO quickly deleted the post. Meantime, Tesla got some big news this week. United Parcel Service has placed a reservation for 125 Tesla semi-trucks. That is the biggest pre-order yet for the electric hauler planned for 2019. The new trucks will join UPS's existing alternative fuel fleet, which is powered by electricity, natural gas, propane, and other non-traditional fuels. Earlier this year, UPS committed to growing its green fleet as part of its goal to reduce its absolute greenhouse gas emissions 12% by 2025. Coming up, Hong Kong is revamping its IPO rules in order to lure a new group of companies to its exchange. Can they prevent another situation like Alibaba's U.S. listing? And Amazon on track for another major milestone for a U.S. retailer. We will dive into Amazon's growth strategy over the next five years. This is Bloomberg.
SoftBank's Massive Vision Fund is adding a fintech startup to its portfolio. SoftBank is betting that tech can overhaul the home insurance industry by leading a $120 million round in New York-based Lemonade. The company uses artificial intelligence and bots to minimize paperwork and speed up the claims process for renters and homeowners. Well, three years ago, Alibaba famously chose to list its IPO in the U.S. on the New York Stock Exchange, abandoning its plans to list in Hong Kong. Now, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is targeting the next Alibaba by revamping its IPO rules. HK Exchange's CEO Charles Lee sat down with Bloomberg in an exclusive interview and explained who they are hoping to attract. Essentially, three key elements. And, you know, one, we're opening uh, a new chapter uh, for biotech companies. Basically, you know, the, 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 the drugs or product have not yet been approved. So, of, co of course, they don't have any revenue yet because they're Well, that's it. I mean, this is the thing yeah. which some people are pointing to, yeah. saying that you're selling out because you're ending this profit requirement for a new IPO. Well, there's no, nothing inherent about having to have a profit. We already have a Chapter 18, which is a mining company. There's no dispute, dispute there's value in there, but unless you build a railroad, you will not be able to sell your minerals. So, you know, we, we do have pre-revenue, pre-profit concept today. Even in the main board today, you're able to uh, list, um, you know, without a profit uh, as long as you are big enough. But I think in this, in, in uh, you know, new reform, Biotech companies, and you know, it's a huge value that has been created in that space. And China is a massive healthcare market. So I think we really want to make sure that we open for business for companies that are in the middle of, uh, you know, uh, clinical trials, but yet not receiving approval to be able to list. So Charles, that was one of the three that you were talking yes, about. Yes. Second, second is really really voting rights, in, you know, basically dual class shares. The third is for secondary listing from companies that are already listed in the U.S. or U.K. Okay, now let's let's move to how uh, this should improve your IPO pipeline. Do you expect me to be talking to you this time next year and saying, "Well, I've doubled the number of people coming to the big board"? Yeah, I think uh, you know it, we, we look at a much broader than just oh, what's the IPO market. Obviously, the IPO market next year is going to be transformative. Next year is going to be fundamentally different from what we have seen before. Right, that, that's great, but. In, but in the end, we are trying to connect the market. We're trying to connect our market, the global market, with China's market. We're also connecting Chinese investors to global you know, um, products. And I think if we are able to introduce a complete new class of new, economic, new economy companies, then our market is going to be fundamentally different, coupled with the money coming from the north, the southbound connect, and with the new economy. I think Hong Kong is going to be an uh, explosive growth story uh, one, uh, for its financial market. So when people want to come and list, they've got to be, quote, innovative, correct? They're well, part you, of the new economy. So how do you define those? I'm, I'm sure it's a very complicated process, but in a nutshell. Yeah, in a nutshell, we, you know, we, we're not only saying you have to be at least new economy, meaning that you know, either technology, and internet, intellectual properties, or whatever else. But that's in and of itself is not enough. We are going to publish a guidance letter that essentially trying to figure out why you particularly have to have this kind of a governance structure. So I think a new economy as a definition is a necessary condition, but there are a whole lot of other factors we'll be looking at it. That was Charles Lee, HK Exchange's chief executive, speaking to Bloomberg's Rashad Salamat. Still ahead, Amazon could outdo its monster year. Why America's e-commerce king could be on track to becoming the first U.S. retailer to sell $1 trillion worth of products and services. Plus, ESPN is in need of new leadership after a shocking announcement. Just who will take the reins of the self-proclaimed worldwide leader in sports? That's next. This is Bloomberg. Get the edge you need to stay ahead. Subscribe to Bloomberg Business Week and receive four bonus issues free. Bloomberg Business Week delivers in-depth reporting and provocative perspectives that take you inside the news each week. Bloomberg's 2,400 journalists worldwide dig deep for stories and insight you can't find anywhere else. Take advantage of this special offer. Order now to get four free bonus issues of the only business magazine powered by Bloomberg. Go to businessweekmag.com slash TV offer. 
Amazon hit several milestones in 2017, including its share price hitting over $1,000. The stock is up 54% for the year. The company could be on track to becoming the first U.S. retailer to sell $1 trillion worth of products and services by 2025. This according to the latest report from Bloomberg Intelligence. We spoke with the analyst who wrote that report, Jatendra Rawal, along with Michael Wolf, CEO of Activate. So if you look at the end markets that Amazon can realistically target globally, excluding China, the size of that market is about $10.7 trillion today. Against that market where Amazon is today, you know, if uh, the reference point I would give you is if the Empire State Building was the market that Amazon can target, Amazon today is on the third floor, mm -hmm. despite of the rapid growth over the last 25 years. So what you're going to end up seeing is uh, that Amazon will, with geographic expansion of Prime, with increasing e-commerce penetration and video strategy that they have, they will conquer a bigger portion of this pie and the trillion dollar number on a gross sales basis, not the net revenue basis, seems very realistic if you actually look at the growth of the end markets uh, that they are participating in. The third floor of the Empire State Building, Michael, would you agree with that? Um, I think that, that they can go even higher than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's some reasons. I mean, one of them is it's not just about the merchandise they're selling. Uh, a big piece of this is some of the other businesses. They are Amazon Web Services, which will continue to grow with the Internet. Uh, the, they are going to be the one company that will challenge Google and Facebook in advertising. They have almost as many visitors in the United States as those two other companies. And then we look at it, we have 60, you know, the, Amazon doesn't re, re, release the numbers on the number of prime customers, but there's about roughly 60 million prime customers. That's half of the U.S. households. And nobody's even looking at the fact that they're likely to be able to raise prices on those customers. And so there's so many, so many tailwinds in terms of growth for this company that you couldn't be more excited about it. Jitendra, what do you think the biggest opportunities are? So if you actually look at what Jeff Bezos said in an interview a couple of months ago, he was asked what could be the fourth pillar for Amazon. He said it could be Alexa or video, and we or Amazon Studios. And we think video could be a very pivotal strategy for Amazon over here because today Amazon makes 90% of their revenues only from five countries. And uh, Prime is available in 16 countries, but Prime Video is available in 200 countries. So what they want to do is use video, original content, to bring in Prime members to increase engagement on the platform, get in, into the advertising business as well, and probably down the line get into content-based e-commerce. Hang on, though. The head of Amazon Studios left after sexual harassment allegations. They haven't had a huge hit this past year. You know, the, the main actor in Transparent is gone. Where do you think these hits are going to come from? Well, they're hoping <laughs> the, the new deals that they signed up, for example, the Lord of the Rings uh, mm -hmm. series that's coming up, uh, and some regional uh, deals that they signed up in uh, India and Asia as well. You know, they're hoping that that could sort of bring in uh, the audiences. But if, if you actually look at consumer surveys of why people are signing up for Amazon Prime, the number one reason is free shipping, but number two uh, is video, and it's becoming an increasingly important uh, reason. Yeah. Do you it, think video is as big an opportunity? I, I, I'm not sure. I think they're spending a lot of money. Uh, they've got some shows um, just like Netflix they're they're really blowing up a, a, a ton of money on this I'm actually more as but Netflix has had more success let's Netflix be, let's has had a lot with. more success but there's other parts of Amazon that people are ignoring or at least not remembering mm -hmm. twitch twitch is a massive video platform people forget twitch is is has tremendous amount of traffic and has been way underexploited. But video may be nothing more than a retention vehicle to get people to spend more time with the site and more with Prime. And our Activate forecast for 2018, actually, we, we believe that speaker sales are going to peak next year hmm. because you're going to have Alexa built into every other device. So it's likely, even though they're going to sell speakers, the price in those speakers is coming way down. So Jatender, what do you think the main weaknesses are? with Amazon. From a threats perspective, regulation uh, mm. ranks the list over here. Within regulation, antitrust um, topics keep on coming, but the bigger issue here is because third-party sellers, business is becoming bigger and bigger for Amazon, the tax collection issue, uh, that could be a, a problem. And then, of course, you have competition from Walmart that could delay their grocery plans uh, or expansion in those verticals. So competition and regulation are the top threats. Mm. 
was Jitendra Walral of Bloomberg Intelligence and Michael Wolf of Activate. While a surprising resignation shook up the sports entertainment world this week, John Skipper has stepped down as the president of Disney-owned ESPN. In a statement on the company website, Skipper said he has struggled with a substance addiction for years, but didn't provide specifics. Former ESPN president and chairman George Bodenheimer will take over as acting chairman on an interim basis. Since the news broke, Bloomberg has learned that Disney will most likely look at two internal candidates to replace Skipper. Bloomberg's media and entertainment reporter Lucas Shaw joined us to discuss. I've spoken with a number of people at ESPN, people who do a lot of work with ESPN. Everybody was very surprised by this. You know, John Skipper is one of the more kind of candid and intelligent executives out there, not the kind of person you'd expect to, kind of, to have a substance abuse problem. And there are people who work very closely with him who had no idea uh, that this was an issue. Um, you know, there had been some rumors about his job security related to the performance of ESPN, but nothing on a personal basis. You know, you saw throughout the day a number of senior ESPN staffers, writers, TV hosts talk about what a great boss he'd been and how supportive he'd been. So this came as, as a complete surprise. All right. The timing is interesting given what ESPN is grappling with. Who do you think might take over here? I would guess that the, the front runner is Justin Connolly, you know, th who is the head of distribution. He oversees their relationships with all these pay TV operators. You know, they've put George Bodenheimer, who ran ESPN for a long time before, and is actually a couple of years younger than John Skipper, back in charge for now. My guess is that's just a temporary thing. Bodenheimer left kind of at the peak, and he probably doesn't want to hand have the stresses of trying to kind of fix some of ESPN's problems over the next several years. He's kind of like a, vi a, ga a comfortable uh, placeholder that everybody knows, who knows the business really well, knows all the employees, and everybody respects. And that gives them time to figure out, do they want to hire someone internally, like Justin Connolly, like Connor Shell, or do they want to go externally? I think Connolly and Shell were both people that may have gotten the job in two or three years when Skipper was ready to retire. And this move today really forces their hand to try and figure it out a little bit sooner. Let's talk a little bit about the challenges facing ESPN. I sat down with Bob Iger a couple of months ago at the Vanity Fair New Establishment Summit and asked this very question what his plans were for ESPN. Take a listen to what he had to say then. ESPN is still a very, very healthy, very, very profitable business, one of our most profitable uh, businesses. It has a stable of live sports that it has licensed for a long period of time that is going to serve it extremely well, that is serving it well today on its traditional platform, that is starting to serve it well on new platforms, and that will serve it well for the foreseeable future. It is a product that is in demand. Lucas, that's actually from an interview in May. You know, given this new twist, you know, how do you think that impacts strategy going forward? Well, you know, the, the scary part about this timing for ESPN is that they're in the middle of trying to build this online service that is probably the biggest new initiative at the company in a really long time. You know, ESPN is the most profitable cable network out there. Uh, or ESPN and Fox News can probably fight for that crown. It's been the crown jewel at ESPN for, or excuse me, at Disney for such a long time. And it has just started to feel the effects of highlights being available all across social media, of being able to watch okay. live sports on Amazon, on Twitter. And so they are trying to figure out how to reimagine that TV network while right. kind of keeping the boat afloat. That was Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw there. And that does it for this edition of the Best of Bloomberg Technology. We'll bring you all the latest in tech throughout the week. Tune in each day, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. All episodes of Bloomberg Tech are live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology Weekdays. That's all for now. Have a wonderful holiday. This is Bloomberg.